Well, how is everybody today? Hopefully I'm coming across uh, loud and clear and um, you all are ready to get with us. Thank you for joining us for St. John River Keep St. John's River Keepers Tributaries and Human Waste Don't Feed the Algae Series. This is, as you guys can see, um, uh, just one um, of the, I guess, various topics that we are covering. It comes to um, how we're talking about algae, how we're talking about um, algae and interacts with the St. John's River, how it forms, um, and then connecting it to various different issues and threads um, uh, of how, of how we can uh, stop it and prevent it. If you wanna check back at any of our previous webinars, we covered um, how algae blooms, how algae blooms interact with uh, flooding issues, how you can be river friendly. This is really talking about at home. Um, sewage sludge, uh, the Akawaha River and how freeing the Akawaha River would help us with some of these algae bloom issues. And then our last topic, really talked about water withdrawals and how water supply and water use um, is also something that connects to this thread of the algae blooms that we see in the St. Johns River. Today though, we're gonna focus specifically on what many of us may be seeing in our backyards, our smaller tributaries, and then how human waste impacts um, are connecting with those smaller tributaries and potentially forming those systems. So a little bit about who we are. St mission is to defend the St. John's River and advocate for its protection. Uh, our, the way that we do that is by investigating uh, potential threats, advocating for policy solutions, um, uh, seeking those solutions, following, finding out what they are, educating the public like we do through this webinar, raising awareness, and then and involving our citizens and everyone that um, uh, continues to be a part of the solution to some of these problems. What we're gonna focus on today is first just a, a basic understanding of how algae forms because that's gonna lay the groundwork for how it's forming in our tributaries and how human waste interacts with that formation. We're also gonna um, uh, talk about how you you can um, uh, report algae blooms that you see, and we'll see what is coming in from the dashboard um, uh, from the Florida Department of uh, Environmental Protection, where we're seeing algae blooms in the river right now. For the basic understanding of algae forms, the St. John's River, unfortunately, already has all of the ingredients and phosphorus and it has it in excessive amounts. In the summer months when we have these rainstorms that hit, we have a lot of runoff coming in um, from our, our roads, from our sidewalks. We're seeing more um, of that excessive amount of, of nutrients in our river. And so because of that, um, uh, we have the makings for potential algae blooms. Also in the summer months, we have have higher temperatures, we have, we'll have slow moving water or wind. And what that does is it pushes um, the excess uh, nutrients into certain areas where it's really um, compounded. And then if you don't have a lot of movement, uh, you can see those, those algae blooms forming. It happens more often in, in the summer. And so that's why um, most often when the, the green monster or massive algal bloom outbreaks, it'll happen in those summer months. Some algae blooms that we're seeing are naturally occurring um, and some are harmful and potentially toxic. And so we'll talk about ways that you can report algae blooms that you're seeing so you can find out whether or not you have uh, some of the, al uh, the, the, the toxic um, or um, uh, not harmful and naturally occurring in your backyard. It isn't possible to know just from looking at it. You do have to have testing to help you understand your exposure um, uh, potential for exposure. At St. John's Riverkeeper, what we try and focus on when it comes to algae blooms is just at the highest level, not just how to um, uh, 
uh, how to avoid your potential exposure, but actually how do we stop it at its source? And that went back to how St. John's Riverkeeper operates, how we work to seek uh, uh, solutions um, and provide uh, policy solutions for that. And so stopping pollution at its source is what we, we try and focus on um, uh, policy and advocacy work. We have to uh, help you all know how to avoid exposure because um, algae bloom can be harmful. Um, it can be harmful if it is ingested. So that is if you're out of the boat or you're, you're water skiing and you have water that comes up and hits you in the mouth, you can potentially um, uh, ingest um, uh, uh, harmful uh, um, algae blooms that way. Also through inhalation, people don't think about this, but if you're out alongside the river walk and you're seeing algae blooms in our, our uh, waterways there, then you can potentially uh, inhale um, algae blooms as well. Uh, neurologically, it can impact us um, and we've seen that through reports connecting uh, long-term algae uh, exposure to um, uh, Alzheimer's and, and other um, neurological diseases. Impacts to our pets, um, uh, if you have water and their algae blooms, try and keep them away. And then of course, these are, are really away from algae blooms, but even fishing, you're catching fish um, in waters that are contaminated with algae blooms. You want to um, try to keep, uh, do not uh, uh, expose yourself by ingesting fish that have been um, uh, caught in waterways with an algae bloom. Now, Lisa, I've unmuted you, and I'm going to turn it over to you to discuss today's um, substance, the, the meat, tributaries, and human waste. Thank you, Shannon, and sorry about the technical difficulties. Can you hear me okay? It's still a little shaky, but I think we'll, we'll do, we, it's the best we've got, so we'll take it. Okay. Um, well, well, thank you all for tuning in to learn more about how tributaries play a vital role in the health of the St. John's River. Um, a tributary is a river or stream that feeds into a larger body of water. So when you think about the St. John's River that's 310 miles long, it obviously has many, many tributaries. And so every tributary that's connected to the St. John's, everything that drains into that river or stream eventually drains into the St. John's River. And so the health of our tributaries are critical and directly connected to the health of the St. John's River. And unfortunately, too many of them are currently polluted um, with too much um, everything for metals and other pollutants. Next slide. And so what we, we see you know, throughout the St. John's River watershed, as well as tributaries throughout the state, this isn't unique to our St. John's, is too much dirt and sedimentation running into our tributaries from construction, um, nutrients from fertilizers, lawns, and as well as septic tank, sewage, sludge, agriculture, bacteria from those same sewage um, sources, as well as wildlife and pet waste and metals um, from industrial discharges. And so all of these pollution sources are important for us to focus on. Um, but today, since we're talking about blue-green algae, we're going to focus in, in human waste, we're going to focus on the human waste sources of tributary pollution. Next slide. And so here's the lower St. John's. Um, this information is directly from the St. John's River report on the lower river, and it tells a sad tale. Um, there are 75 tributaries within the lower St. John's, and the lower St. John's is from the mouth of the Ocklawaha, just north of, of Lake George, all the way up to Mayport. But 75 tributaries are impaired for fecal coliform and bacteria coming from human waste. 36 of the tributaries have total maximum daily loads, so it's been identified these sources, and 25 of those actually have a basin management action plan where there has been some um, good, there's been some success, there's been a reduction of bacteria in many of these tributaries, but they're all still impaired and too sick with too much bacteria from human waste and other sources. Next slide. And 
so here you see that the whole entire lower St. John's River does have a B-map. Those little blue um, square um, indications within that the green, those are individual tributary B-maps. So that shows where the TMDLs, and so there's been a lot of focus on these areas, but there's still much, much work that needs to be done. Next slide. And Shannon, as you're moving it forward, just want to check, are y'all hearing me okay? It's still pretty, um, it's still pretty jumpy, Lisa. Uh, I don't have any suggestions though for um, fixing it. For our guests, can you understand me okay? I don't want to waste your time if you can't understand me. Uh, Lisa, this is Jim Schwartz. I, I can hear you. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of crinkly, but, uh, but I, can, I can understand you, yes. And, and we thank had you, to thank you, Pat, for the, the Patricia or that take the thumbs up. Thank you all. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but let's talk about why we're here today. Um, sewage. Um, sewage is a major contributor to algae outbreaks. Um, so human waste has a high level of nitrogen and phosphorus. And if, as you heard Shannon just mentioned, those are um, um, sources or the uh, blue-green algae. And we're seeing septic systems have a substantial source of nutrients. Most septic tank systems are designed to reduce bacteria. Um, they're not designed to take out nitrogen and phosphorus. They do a little bit better job with nitrogen. I mean, I'm sorry, with phosphorus, but we see high levels of nitrogen running off the septic tank systems. And of course, when they fail, then you have bacteria and more nutrient pollution. And we see way too many failing septic tanks throughout the St. John's River watershed and sadly throughout the state. And then it's also sanitary sewer overflows. Um, these are uh, sanitary sewers, so our sewer lines that either overflow due to um, human error, contractor error due to blockages or too much rainfall, um, like we've seen in many hurricanes throughout the state. And so those are then the main sources we're seeing of uh, sewage within our tributaries, which eventually makes it to the St. John's River. Next slide. And so let's talk about septic tanks for a minute. When you have septic tanks, you have a, a, a drain field. And so the, the um, thank you, David, the, um, as the waste is percolated through the ground, it takes out, it's designed to take out bacteria, it takes out phosphorus, but you still get too much nitrate, the form of nitrogen, into our groundwater. And so you have groundwater contamination as well as surface water contamination when you have failing septic tanks and have too much rainfall that's washing out those drain fields. And so we're very concerned about our tributaries from the surface water contamination, but also concerned about our springs which our springs are also tributaries of the St. John's with their spring run. There's more than 100 freshwater springs that provide freshwater to the St. John's River. Next slide. And so let's look at Silver Springs. Silver Springs is one of the largest freshwater springs in the St. John's River system. Um, it was the, it's an iconic spring. It was a tourist attraction, uh, still is a tourist attraction for our state. And unfortunately, it's severely impaired from nitrate, a form of nitrogen from, um, from human waste. Next slide. So this shows what Silver Springs looks like in its heyday. And next slide. And unfortunately, this is what it looks like today. Due to too much nitrate and nutrients coming out of the spring then, coming from groundwater. So not only is this impacting our springs, it's impacting the St. John's River. And the, um, the, there actually is a total maximum daily load for Silver Springs. And it recommends a 79% reduction of nitrate into that system which is next to impossible. And more than half of that is actually coming from septic tanks. So it demonstrates that we have a septic tank problem throughout the state um, and definitely within the St. John's River watershed. 
In addition, septic tanks are vulnerable to, to sea level rise. So as we talked about during our first session on resiliency, um, sea level rise, as well as increasing rainfall, is making the issues that we all have been working on together for decades, making it even more dire that we take immediate action. With sea level rise, you have a water table that rise, rises, and so the distance between the septic tank drain filled area and groundwater is much less, so you don't have the filtration that currently exists, so there's less opportunity for the soil to treat the wastewater, and then, of course, heavier rains make it more vulnerable to runoff and failing systems impacting our groundwater and surface water. Next slide. So this slide actually came out of a study in Miami that was done, and they're looking at septic tanks and how, how vulnerable are they? And it was extremely concerning what they found. So currently, you see on these different functioning systems, there is significant ground, um, unsaturated soil for percolation to filter out. And this does a pretty good job, as I mentioned, on bacteria and phosphorus, not so much nitrate. But if you look at the next slide, you'll see as sea level rise gr grows, you start having the groundwater rises with it. And so that part starts to submerge existing sewer systems makes them very vulnerable to, to more pollution, as well as you lose purification on some of the others that are a little bit higher. So this is something we need to tackle in statewide. This is not just a South Florida issue, but there's significant studies showing that, that this is going to continue to be um, more and more problematic as we have more sea level rise and we haven't got our arms around current day situations. Next slide. So the next one is sanitary sewer overflows. Again, these are the sewers that get backed up to rainfall. A lot of time when we, you see heavy rain, you see storm drains like, I mean, sewer drains like this, it's actually sewage just coming out of the systems, as well as you can have um, other, other impacts on blockages and things like that. In 2019, JEA reported nearly a million gallons of released um, sanitary sewer into our waterways. And that was a combination of pipe failure as well as blockages or contract area um, errors, excuse me. And then we also had significant sanitary sewer overflows as a re direct re impact from Hurricane Matthew. In Hurricane Matthew, there were 11 million gallons of sanitary sewer overflow. And unfortunately, JEA did take some, um, some they, they took some proactive measures after that, and they reduced their sanitary sewer overflows in Irma. However, there still was more than 2.5 million gallons of wastewater released into our tributaries. And so it's critical that we get our arms around protecting and preventing sanitary sewer overflows from impacting our tributaries and our St. John's River. Next slide. And I forgot to mention that sea level rise also makes sanitary sewer overflows um, potentially more problematic due to more rainfall and, and higher um, and, and more runoff um, causing those issues. So that's something to watch. But let's talk about the good news. You know, fortunately, they're, they're, um, we have the Blue Green Algae Task Force um, that's been meeting for more than a year. They just had their first 2020 meeting this past week. Um, and they created a, a consensus document. It came out last October. And they recognize these issues that we're talking about today as extremely important um, to regulate and to, um, to get our arms around to prevent Blue Green Algae Task Force. Um, while we were disappointed they didn't have more detail in their report, we were pleased that the governor's own scientists, they put, you know, they basically codified these issues that we've all been worried about for many years. And so some of the recommendations that the task force um, made to the governor was to have the Florida Department of Environmental Protection regulatory oversight um, to septic tank systems, or a fancy term is on-site sewage treatment and disposal systems. There are different types of septic tanks. Um, they also recommended a mandatory septic tank inspection and monitoring program 
funding to accelerate septic to sewer programs, emergency backup power on lift stations to prevent sanitary sewer overflows, and a more protective uh, or excuse me, a proactive approach to address infiltration and inflow issues. Those are basically le leaky pipes for the old pipes we have throughout Florida in our sewer system, really needing to address those leaky pipes. So those are recommendations that came out of the Blue Green Algae Task Force specifically for human sewage. Next slide. In Senate Bill 712, one, we believe that it did not go far enough holistically or comprehensively to truly um, get us to where we need to be to protect water quality, especially with sea level rise issues that we're seeing making us more vulnerable. They did, there were some significant improvements for septic tanks and wastewater treatment facility, but some of them de depend on rulemaking. And so it's very important that we track this rulemaking. And for those of you on the call that are um, technically minded, that are interested in engaging um, we'd, we would like to recruit you all to help us participate in rulemaking um, exercises as they come into play because the utilities are at the table, um, industry's at the table, we, we are at the table with St. John's Riverkeeper, but the public needs to be engaged on these rulemaking to make these provisions that were within Senate Bill 712 a true reality. So a couple things on septic tank. Um, there, oops, Shannon, can you go back? A couple, is, well, she's going back, a couple things on septic tank is that it's recommending a transfer of oversight from the Department of Health to the Department of Environmental Protection. And that's an effort to fully focus on the environmental issues with septic tanks, not just the health. And we're reporting um, enhanced nutrient reduce, um, reducing systems, a fast track approval process that's underway. A technical advisory committee, this is something that happened in 2021, but with a report to the governor in 2020, and then rulemaking to focus on location of septic tanks in environmentally sensitive areas. That's not to begin until 2022. So one of the things we will be advocating is fast tracking some of these rulemakings. Um, with sea level rise and with the current state of affairs, we need these things to be implemented sooner than later. There will also be rulemaking to reduce the leaky pipes to try to repair some of those pipes. Unfortunately, there was no deadline. Um, there were requirements to report sanitary sewer overflows and ideas for mitigation prevention. There's no deadline. So those are the types of things we need to happen sooner than later. Um, and in both the septic and wastewater treatment facilities, they are recommending if either one of those is more than 20% of the problem in an in a area with the basic management action plan, they must have a, a plan to address those issues. Unfortunately, a plan does not mean it's enforced and the, the deadline on that's not till July, 2025. So while there are some things in here that we believe are baby steps forward, we must aggressively deal with these issues um, and have some real teeth behind these ideas in these words. And that's where we think Senate Bill 712 falls short. There is a grant program that will provide more dollars towards some of these upgrades, but they only allocated 25 million for this past year. And that's a small drop in the bucket. For example, just in Duval County alone, to phase out septic tanks in environmentally sensitive areas, it would be more than 300 million. And that's just one county of 67. And so there's still a lot of work to be done, which we'll be advocating for in 2021's legislative session. Next slide. And another little bit of good news, um, Doctors Lake has been a very dangerous lake um, in the lower St. John's River, it's one of the St. John's River Lake. This photo was taken by Dr. Jerry Pinto um, in the height of an outbreak with children. If you can see it actually inner tubing behind this boat. And so we as St. John's River Keeper went out and did sampling and it was this bloom as well as others that year was highly toxic. And there were some remediation pet projects that were funded um, thanks to Senator Rob Bradley. And those projects are underway to offset the blue-green algae in Doctors Lake. But again, this is one lake of the many lakes that make up the St. John's River system. And while this is helpful for this area, we have to have a holistic, comprehensive approach. Next slide. So what can we do? 
Um, one thing that the Blue Green Algae Task Force recommended that was not um, implemented was mandatory septic tank inspections. This is critical that we have mandatory septic tank inspections and, and then the maintenance required to offset um, any problems that are found. We also have to continue to demand sustainable growth with, with um, advanced wastewater treatment um, facilities. We have to deal with human waste. We can't just keep playing whack-a-mole with our sewage issues as we have talked about with sewage sludge as well as septic tanks and sewer. We all need to be river friendly, continuing to do our part to reduce our nutrient footprint along our tributaries. Um, and if you do have a septic tank, get it inspected, perform needed maintenance. And if you can upgrade to advanced treatment septic tanks or hook onto sewer if it's available, um, that's it's critical to protecting your tributary and where, where you live. Um, advocate for fast track rulemaking. The rulemaking will only be um, protective as if, if it's, if it's move forward and it's enforced. And so that rulemaking, we can't wait till 2025. And support funding for septic tank phase out and advanced treatment. And then if you can join us on August 19th, we'll be talking about in that webinar policy solutions and looking towards the 2021 legislative session on what we can do together, as well as working with our local, our local governments to do more to phase out septic tanks. And I do just want to recognize in chat, one of the other problems that I know many are concerned about with Senate Bill 712 was at the last minute they included a poison pill where they prohibited rights to nature movements at the local government. And, and that obviously did not belong um, in that bill, um, nor should that have been snuck in at the last minute. So thank you for adding that chat. But with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Shannon. And thank you all for bearing with me. I apologize about my internet services today. Um, it's my son's 14th birthday, so I told him I would stay here today, and I didn't realize my internet would be so shaky. But thank you for bearing with me. Lisa, you did a great job. Uh, and so thank you for all of that. Thank you for helping us connect those dots, um, because it is important when we're talking about algae blooms that we really think about all the inputs and then all the impacts. And many of us interact with the St. John's River, not necessarily on the main stem, but in our backyard and streams. So um, it's good to know uh, the health of those. And speaking of that, um, uh, we talked a lot about uh, understanding algae blooms, understanding types, avoiding it, and the importance of um, reporting it. Uh, if anyone is unfamiliar or just FDEP and algal blooms, then you'll come across their algal bloom dashboard, which is this right here. I did a screenshot of it this morning. Um, there were in 130 different um, uh, uh, locations where the DEP went out and did testing throughout the state of Florida. And I zoomed into this St. John's just so that you all could see those blur because they did a lot of sampling recently. And I'll go to um, the, show you guys some pictures of some of those. Um, make sure if you're seeing algae blooms in the river that you are reporting them to the DEP so that they know about them so they can go out and do that testing. And then you can click on each one of those blue dots and find out if um, toxins were present and if toxins were present, what kind and if uh, whether or not they were toxic. So if you're thinking about getting out on the boat or recreating and you really want the most current up-to-date information on where algae blooms have been spotted, that's the place to go. So it's not only a, a place to report it, but it's a place for you to get um, uh, insight as well before doing um, any recreation, especially if you have um, young children or older individuals you or anyone with a compromised immune system, it's important to know that. If you are out in the river and you are seeing algae blooms, then um, not only reporting it to the DEP, but it would be great if you could report it to us as well. And I have my contact information here. Um, just the date, time, location, and what you saw, because what I could do with that is not only get the word out via social media, um, but also make sure that the DEP did go out and do testing and so that we can respond to people to understand when, whether it's more of a naturally occurring and just um, uh, you know concentrations of some of that 
um, less dangerous algae on the water. These are two reports that we received in the past um, two weeks since our last uh, Don't Feed the Algae presentation. We had a report in from uh, around Sadler Point Marina, and you can see some of those, you know, green, um, that, that bright lime green uh, uh, sort of um, uh, traces within the water column there. And then next to it, Florida Yacht Club, which anyone that's familiar with the Ortega River and the St. John's in this area, these are both pretty close to each other. And so this was another report. We got some more along the main stem. Um, if you're in the, the Riverside area, we had some reports from around um, St. Vincent's and Stockton Street. And if you look back at that dashboard, the DEP did go out to all of those sites. They did test them um, and they came back as being not toxic. So if you're in the area right now, um, that's a, a bit of a sigh of relief, right? Because we've got some other things going on. Um, we don't have a toxic algae bloom in the river right now. So that's a good thing um, and great that the testing is happening so frequently um, to let us know that. To everyone that is tuned in today, um, we're going to jump to questions after this. But uh, I do want to highlight that we are a member-based organization. We want to thank our members for submitting images of the algae bloom reports um, and encourage you, if you're not a member, to become one and start receiving our um, communications, learn about more of the events that we have co coming up uh, and going on right now um, and different levels for that. If you're not ready to become a member with us, um, then check out our, our website. Um, stjohnsriverkeeper.org and look at some of our merchandise. This is a, a great Don't Feed the Algae show goes along with this series um, that you can whenever you're tuning in virtually to our webinars or out when you're on the water. Um, and, uh, and again, I know Lisa highlighted this before, but our next um, uh, in this series is going to be our final episode of Don't Feed the Algae, where we're really going to sum it all up with what are the policy solutions that we want to see happen? What are the policy solutions that need to happen? And what are the kinds of solutions that would address the issues that we've been talking about in every single episode leading up to um, that uh, conclusion or finale, if you will, for, for the series? So we're excited about that. And hopefully you guys will tune in and join us there. But with that, we received Excellent questions uh, before the um, uh, 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 webinar kicked off today, and then we've been receiving some great ones in the chat. I apologize for anyone watching us on Facebook Live. Um, I won't be able to jump over to Facebook and see the questions, but would encourage you to register and attend our um, uh, via Zoom for our next presentation. But Lisa, I want to ask you about um, a question specific to septic tanks and, and really even specific to Duval County. Um, uh, there's been funding to remove septic tanks in Duval County um, and, and specifically failing septic tanks near tributaries, which we kind of focused on today. What's the status of some of that? Um, and if you can give us uh, more of the insight as to what's going on with uh, septic tank funding in Duval County. Yeah, I, I wish there was a better answer, but unfortunately, the city of Jacksonville has continued to kick the can down the road on, um, there was several years ago, they had allocated $15 million towards septic tank removal. And then that, then JEA had agreed to match that $15 million. Um, and unfortunately, it's continued to be pushed off to later years. However, with the budget that's currently going in front of city council, um, there is five million of that 15 allocated for this next fiscal year, fiscal year 2021. And so the details of that have not come out. They'll, um, we'll get more of that information this month as they start to have the budget discussion. And so um, we should have more detail about that. 5 million that's currently in the 2021 budget for Duval County at the August 19th webinar. Um, I will say though, again, you know, that it, this is a much bigger issue. Um, just this one county alone, as we mentioned, it's a $300 million um, um, endeavor. And, and that's not even looking at failing septic tanks in Palatka and in Indian River County, you know, in Brevard, you know, they're failing septic tanks throughout the St. John's River. And so we really need a more holistic, aggressive approach from our state lawmakers. 
Um, and so that's something that we'll be advocating for. And we need our local governments to, because our local governments don't have the capacity to do it on their own. Lisa, um, I, I want to find out if um, either if you know this or maybe you can help folks to find to, to tell them where the information might be found. How many septic tanks are in the St. John's River, I guess, region and tributaries? Um, where do we get information about the quantity of septic tanks? Yeah, so, so we can, we just need to do the math out of the existing um, total maximum daily loads. For example, we, we know how many exist in the different TMDLs, but there's, you know, there's 25 tributaries in the lower St. John's. So we need to do the math. You know, we know that there's 2.5 million in the entire state of Florida. Um, there's six, there's, you know, there, what's the number standing in Duval? I think it's there 90,000 in Duval. I think there's 100,000 in Volusia County. And so that's something that we, we need to find all the sources we know about county by county and do the math and, and provide that to you. Um, Lisa, we got a question. Uh, Specifically, it's it's a different one, and I don't know if you know the answer to it, but it was about all of these car washes that are going up. Um, and I mean, we've seen them here in Duval, but I think throughout the whole watershed, these new car washes. And so do you have any information on um, some of the required treatment or how that might impact um, these various issues that we've been talking about today? No, I, I Thank you for that question. I saw it before our, our new meeting and did a quick Google search and I did not um, get to exhaust the research on it. I know that there are there are certain requirements. I know there's been problems with pop-up car washes that don't necessarily go through the appropriate permitting. Um, but I, I do believe that that is something that, um, that's a great question and I don't know the answer, but we'll put that on our list of things to find out. And we have your contact information um, from you submitting that question prior to. So we'll, we'll look into that and thank you for raising that issue. I have two more quick questions I'm gonna ask because I think that we can, um, I think we can answer these uh, uh, well. What's the best strategy to get the legislature to require the septic tank inspections that you mentioned? Well, and, and that is a great question. As many of you know, this was passed and then immediately repealed. And, and one of the best ways to do it is for us to work collectively with our partners across the state. Um, I know Wayne Mills recently connected us with Friends of the Everglades. We're working with Friends of the Everglades and other folks across the state to have legislative priorities. And if we have a collective voice across the state, not only with other environmental groups, but also association of counties. The association of counties, you know, that was something they were interested in and other um, non-traditional partners. But the more organized we are in having a statewide vote, voice of diverse members, then that's the best way we can get to the legislature. Um, you know, local governments pay a huge price for not having this done. And I know when in Duval County, when this was repealed, they were trying to um, maintain the right to do it locally. So it's, it's one of those that we need to have a collective voice with as many partners as we have and work on the offense before the 2021 session. Thank you, Lisa. The, the last question um, I, I, I think would be a good one to end with. We focused on human waste today in the presentation, but we had a question about um, cattle and horse uh, contamination. And I know that especially in the upper basin and middle basin, agricultural um, waste is uh, uh, definitely a contributor here. So maybe just help us to find out uh, where the resources are to find out more about that or how much of an impact you think that that is to the algae blooms that we're seeing um, throughout the basin. Yeah, thank you for that question. And, and that is a major concern, um, especially in the upper basin. There's a lot of, a lot of cattle farms um, and they're using sewage sludge. So it's, it's you know, there, there's, there's impact. And, and there is one of the things that's in Bill 712 that it mentioned that it did not implement um, was focusing on more protective um, best management practices for agriculture. You know, right now there's a presumption that if they have a best management practice that, that they're reducing pollution. 
but monitoring near agricultural sites is showing that's not the case. And so, you know, on one hand, it's been everyone's recognized they need to be improved. What they haven't acknowledged is that they need to be enforced. And so the Department of Agriculture and Best Management um, Practices Program is where the protection should be. Um, we, Waterkeepers Florida, has been working with their water policy guru, Chris Pettit, um, on looking at those best management practices. But we really need the enforcement piece. And, and, and that's going to be a challenge because our legislature is very agriculturally friendly. Um, and we believe that you can enforce good water quality protections and be supportive of agriculture at the same time. They depend on clean water as well. So we're, we're hoping to continue to enforce that, but that's something if you want to look at what currently exists, it's through the, I, the best management practice program with the Department of Agriculture. Thank you, Lisa. I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Um, and again, mark your calendar for August 19th at noon, where we will wrap series up with a conversation policy solutions. Uh, and you all then tune in.